Hello, everyone. I'm Dominique. And I'm Christina. And we are the Connected in Glass podcast. Every week, we will feature interviews with glass artists who speak to their creative processes and overcoming challenges. These conversations are real and raw. We hope that by sharing these stories, you're able to find some connection and know that you're not alone. We just wanted to take a moment to thank you for listening to our podcast. We're super passionate about this project and work for hours every week to bring you this content. So if you'd like to help support us, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash connected in glass. Also, please consider joining our Facebook group, Connected in Glass Community, where we continue the conversations from these episodes. We'd love to hear from you. This episode of Connected in Glass is sponsored by Diddy Clips. Diddy Clips has changed the way we film our glass blowing videos, and we're proud to be working with them. Today, we're interviewing Rachel Cauldron. Rachel is a glass artist based in Downington, Pennsylvania, who has been working with glass since 2007. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Thanks Hello. for joining us. Thank you for having me. All right. We're so excited to get to know you. We already know a little bit about where you live, but maybe tell us a little bit more about that. Maybe skip the glass part of your life for right now. Tell us what you enjoy besides glass, what you do for fun, and then get us into the story of how you started working with glass. Hey, the run down memory lane. Yeah, so I live in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, which is more kind of country setting, which is nice. The older I get, the, the more I start, you know, uh, getting away from the, the city and uh, more into the country. You know, nature is a big part of my life and my uh, quiet time and my downtime. A stress reliever, so walking, hiking with my dogs. But besides that, I try to take some, some time off for myself and I go riding. Some days I have a trainer, so... I have horseback riding with my aunt's horse. Um, and, uh, so I'm learning how to ride properly, which is you know, stressful in itself, but it's fun. And so I always need to find that um, balance you know, between work and you know, personal time. How did you start working with glass that started in 2007? Yeah, well, I guess I'll go back a little bit before then. You know, I graduated high school in 2000, which was during like the big graphic design boom, you know, so everyone was doing it. So I went to uh, school originally for graphic design and uh, yeah, I did not care for it. So you know, I got out kind of the norm and served you know, after that and stayed in the restaurant biz and, you know, I was kind of down and out because I really wanted to get back into the swing of things and so yeah, I uh, you know did the the life adventure and uh, backpack through Europe, you know, to find myself <laughs> for a few months. And when I did, I, I met a lady on a train, and she was a teacher. So after I got off that two-hour train ride, I knew I wanted to teach, and so I started applying and started getting a portfolio back in order. And I was accepted to Tyler School of Art, and that was kind of the kick of it. My foundation year, you know, you kind of do everything and anything, but it was still more two-dimensional, which I was always used to. And with graphic design and computer work, just me personally, I was just kind of disconnected and it just didn't flow right. So I'm really being down and out. And there was this girl in my foundation year and she was like, well, have you ever seen glass blowing? And uh, I was like, I don't even know what that is. (laughs) So the glass studio, which I was then led to, was in this two car garage or maybe three and I walked in and there was these you know this fire and music and people working together and this material and uh, I was mesmerized right away so I knew like that was it Um, I don't think there was many times in my life where I was like that's it very airy so everything's always open but there was that moment where I knew that I wanted to proceed you know, in, uh, in uh, the glass world. And that was pretty much it. It started from there. So yeah, I you know, really gave it my all and you know, continued on. 
So you went to Tyler because you wanted to be a teacher. Were you thinking that you wanted to be an art teacher? Was that your focus? Yeah, so I wanted to teach and I was kind of, I didn't really know what the degree was or was double majoring or, so it pretty much came down to learning, you know, that you can get a K through 12, but I wanted to teach college level. I wanted to you know, be like my mentors, my professors that I was seeing with the students that were there, you know, specifically for that reason, not just taking an elective in high school, but then finding out that you, know, you need your bachelor's and then you go for your master's. And with Temple's program, the professors had to be active artists as well. The professors, so they had their curriculum. They also had their art that they had to make and they had to be in, you know, involved in galleries and shows and really you know, promoting themselves as well as teaching. So it was a lot. And so I said, you know what, well, one day I will do it on my own then. You know, I definitely still wanted to teach, but, uh, you know, being the artist and being, you know, a glass blower was important. I really wanted to focus and learn everything and every aspect I could while I was in college, knowing you only had this time and these resources to really go all out and experiment and have your peers and your professors and all these different aspects that you don't really have when you go out in the real world, they kind of just dissipate. So as college came to an end, you had to make a big decision on how you're going to continue doing class and you didn't want to spend the time and money it would take to get a graduate degree to not get paid enough to cover those expenses, right? (laughs) So can you take us to where you went after that? Yeah, so I was fortunate to come out with a job already for a glass artist in Philadelphia that did lighting and you know had his own hot shop there as well and uh, started with lighting and you know cold working and stuff like that eventually led to being a bubble starter and assisting so that was good to keep the ball rolling at the same time I'm thinking well what can I do for you know myself on my own of course the, the mind kind of went to you know, flame working, because it's a lot easier to set up flame working, you know, a bench torch than it is a glass studio. Uh, glass <laughs> studios are quite expensive to run and the overhead is pretty crazy. But with the torch, you know, there's a lot more you can do it in your basement and so on and so forth. But then I was kind of getting the realm of you know, the go-to, which is you know, smoking apparatuses, which eventually I didn't want to do. So there just wasn't any. So I uh, had received a scholarship to Pilchuck uh, School of Glass for a six-week course. I was very fortunate there. And had a class with Ross Richmond that worked under Billy Morris. Um, so him teaching inside sculpting and being in that environment really kept you know, my determination and what I had experienced there. You know, so it was just lucky that you know, I had these little moments to keep that ball rolling and the focus you know, at the same time. So I met someone there and, you know, a few months after that, she had called and asked if I wanted to assist at another private studio, which I did and was there for years and helped me because one of the benefits was using the hot shop just to, you know, make our own stuff. So that was very, I was very lucky with that opportunity. And, you know, Burn Branch kind of was already in the works right after college. I knew I wanted to give back. So, you know, I became a 501c3 nonprofit. You know, it's really not about making a profit. It's about, you know, giving back, making the work. I'm a people pleaser. So (laughs) it kind of like stems into that of trying to make everyone happy or, but really it's it's about making the work. And, you know, even today, just seeing that smile, like, oh, and, and genuine, happiness just from this little object that's what it's about and um, teaching the classes and people so excited and so pumped up afterwards and having a great time and it helps me out because it kind of like puts me back to the beginner stage and sometimes a new little idea or color technique or something pops up from a student and that's you know so they teach me as much as I'm teaching them. So I'm very fortunate to be doing that today. So it took a really long time <laughs> to get, you know, my own studio up and running and 
Yeah, and everything where it's at. Want to tell us a little bit about your studio space? Yeah, I rent from another company, actually. So my space, WGK, they're flame workers. And I have this wonderful, huge, I think it's uh, close to 1,500 or so square foot in the country side and down like 500 feet down the road. So I've been really fortunate to uh, be able to go into the space and pretty much be subjected or kind of underlying promoted almost from their clientele. And they're like, oh, there's this blast blowing here. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, hi. And so another fortunate thing that has happened and it's just on like a farm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you made your studio into a nonprofit? Yeah. So I'm in recovery about four years almost now. So I have always struggled with, well, it was mainly alcohol my whole life. I call myself addict because I believe they're all intertwined. So I'm a recovering addict. Um, during this process and during my life and schooling, that's when, you know, all that, I always had these moments of really bad and then okay, but somehow always kept the ball rolling, always kind of kept it behind closed doors, you know, and at the same time, you know, I have depression and, you know, I have all these other labels. <laughs> so with mental health, which, you know, I started you know, self medicate not knowing or, you know, just, yeah, trying to fill voids or whatever the you know, there's a lot of reasons for everything, but yeah. So at first I um, had made it so that the funds would go back into underfunded school districts in their art program. It was my way. It was kind of like a almost beat around the bush passive way of trying to keep kids out of those environments of drugs and stuff and finding outlets by, you know, helping these art programs. And then as it was going, realizing that um, every school, <laughs> you know, is art program is like one of the first things that gets defunded. So it was just very overwhelming for such a small I mean, me, you know, a little person trying to do this nonprofit and have funds to put in these schools. And it just it was too much for me to bite. At the same time, you know, I was struggling with my own addictions in and out of, I wouldn't even say recovery because I never was in recovery, you know, or I'll go to a meeting, but we'd still do an X, Y, and Z or whatever the case may be. And so, yeah, in 2018, and this is all while still getting everything going, only really close people, only a few people really saw, you know, what, who I was, you know, what my problems were and the substance abuse. But, you know, so at, so everyone else thought I was this very hard worker and just going with the ball, which I mean, I was, but I was also, you know, <laughs> over there just completely falling apart. So back in 2018, you know, I, yeah, just kind of lost it. And I received three DUIs in 30 hours, already having one. And in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I, had to go uh, upstate you know, to do some time there. So I was incarcerated for a year and a half. Um, but prior to that, right after all that happened, I went right into the full-blown recovery. Something happened. I don't know exactly what it was. I wish I did. I tell people all the time. You know, I, I wish I had that moment and I wrote it down in stone. I can share it with everyone. But, you know, that was my own personal and everyone has their moments of clarity or whatever it may be to, you know, get them in gear for recovery. Everyone's, you know, they say bottom is different. So I've hit in a lot worse bottoms, I think, but something really scared me that time. So I went right in the recovery. I started with Refuge Recovery, which was amazing. It's like a Buddhist inspired recovery program. You know, it's called uh, Recovery Dharma now. Uh, that's where I found how to, you know, it's the first stepping stones of the tools that I needed to be in recovery because recovery is just not about giving up your substance or whatever it may be. It doesn't even have to be, you know, drug related. And uh, yeah, so I found meditation and mindfulness, found all these wonderful people and the tools and 
the courage and found that it was kind of within myself always to um, be able to kind of conquer this, you know. So going, coming incarcerated, had a lot of free time and time to think, but I also had my recovery behind me. So that was nice. And I had a lot of time to really think and wonder what my next step was going to be when I came. I knew I wanted to get Burning Branch really up and going uh, full force, which it was, but not where I needed it to be, you know, in the, in the sense where other people needed it to be. So that's where it came to putting um, our funds into under our under, instead of underfunded school districts, like a passive way, I wanted to be a little bit more direct. And I wasn't afraid of saying, hello, you know, I'm an addict. So uh, now we put it into um, our recovery houses, our local recovery houses, by starting up alternative art therapy programs. And the alternative part is using the glass blowing studio as the means for the art therapy. There's you know, every traditional, you know, you're, you're painting or you're, you're communicating, you have groups and stuff like that. But I wanted to get a little bit more physical. I feel glass, glass blowing in itself has so many different aspects that someone coming out of uh, addiction needs just, uh, you know, kind of reconnecting uh, with getting out and not, you know, kind of hibernating and hiding from the world because you're all types of crazy <laughs> with emotions and feelings and not knowing what's what and guilt and shame and yeah and just feeling because you haven't for a very long time you know and be able to talk again so communicating with you know, the person that you're gaffing with assisting which you know glass blowing is really important to have that communication and that connection with your assistant or your gaffer with the material and at the same time you know creating exploring and so glass can be for anyone but there's definitely a lot of different aspects that I feel that glass blowing can contribute for people in recovery and I you know from everything anything that you know even if it's just depression or you know any um, aspects that they are struggling with but it started in the recovery houses it's my way of giving back you know and then it's just not not the way it's just a way you know another tool in the toolbox as they say you know or experience that may lead them to x y and z on their own path so yeah that's pretty much where we're at in a nutshell today <laughs> are you managing all this by yourself or are you able to have some help now maybe volunteers that like what you're doing yeah so like another ask you know my own recovery and I'm still learning, but I've always been like, I have to do it myself kind of person, not because or of ego or in, you know, my way or the highway. It was more because I never, I, you know, don't want to bother anyone or, you know, take up their time. So now actually I have a great friend that we had met in college, Kevin McGarrigle. So he has jumped on board to start helping out because it has been a one man band. And, it, you know, there is a lot of aspects that still is that I need a lot of help and I am finally asking for it, knowing that it's okay and that there is people out there and there is, and I have a great support system. I still am like, no, okay, I got it, you know, <laughs> but I really don't, you know, that's okay. You know, as I was focusing on just the studio, you know, this past couple of years and getting everything up and running and trying to kind of coordinate and figure out the nonprofit, the small business, being in the artist, you know, and a designer, and then being the business manager and the, you know, packing and shipping and <laughs> um, so tech. Tech. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been a lot. Yeah. And then the social media, which I've never been good at, you know, all these aspects that uh, I'm still trying to juggle. Kevin came on board. He kind of went into flame working after college. So yeah, scientific glassware. So he was, um, you know, wanted to start helping, brought him on board. He is now he's technically, you know, co-head director. So that's a good start. And um, hopefully once to get everything under control, you know, I do have other people that are helping out and we're now finally doing, since everything's been 
registered for years, you know, for grants and, you know, government grants and all that other kind of stuff. Finally had the time to actually do it, which probably should have been one of the first things. <laughs> but it always, that was, it's always been a weak spot for me. Uh, so I'd sit there and like try to read everything and just read the same paragraph over and over again for a grant and just go, oh, I'll go back to making, you know, it's my strong point. So, but yeah, so it is finally starting to come together. And, you know, really excited to have this opportunity to share my experience and have Kevin on board and all those little stepping stones and yeah. That's really cool. Do you think that as you went through school and as you're going through this process that people treat you differently as a woman? Or do you feel like it's been pretty equal? Well, there's definitely moments. You know, there I there has been um, moments or uh, places where I have worked where I was definitely undermined because I was a woman. But I also, you know, being also a, a landscaper during this process for eons, hardscaper, you know, I also know how to deal with the, uh, you know, the, the, that macho kind of, I got this. And then I'm like, no, I got this. I'm going to show you kind of thing. But um, also have that personality that you know, I'm like a chameleon. So <laughs> it's kind of a good and bad. So I also have this like masculinity. Me. I mean, equally at the same time, very feminine, very emotional. And so, and, you know, feminist at heart too. <laughs> uh, so yeah, there's definitely been moments, especially in the last glowing world, I should say. Um, I think for... Uh, as being a woman is fought, you know, uh, there's more men in the glass blowing room than there is, you know, in say flame working or uh, stained glass uh, slumping and fusing. You know, you tend to find the, a lot of women in the other areas of glass, which is great. And there is a lot of badass you know, glass feminine or female glass artists to name a whole crap load, not just glass blowers, but stained glass and sculpture, design, and lighting. And so it's amazing, even artware and jewelry or bodywear, you know? So yeah, I think that it is changing. We are starting to be seen, especially this last decade. I don't think, I think it is pockets, you know, because the founders, you know, this few guys up in uh, Pilchuck, you know, there was, there's a woman there too, <laughs> you know? So there was a couple and, so it's always been in the scene, but uh, I think that it's just because it is a very demanding medium, you know, glass blowing itself. You find mentalities, more masculine mentalities that are, oh, I got that because it's too heavy or stuff like that. Now it's just, I'm just happy where I'm at. And I mean, if if there's a you know competition or if some you know someone comes up and goes you can't do it I will prove them wrong regardless you know so or I'll damn try <laughs> yeah give it my all um, and then I think that's all you know every one of us should do is give it our all so yeah. I was wondering when you started telling people that you were an addict. Did you find that people treated you differently? And if you did, how did you kind of like navigate that? The word addict, you know, definitely has a sting to um, it and to a lot of people because a lot of people have dealt with it some one way, shape or form. So I try to stay away from the word, you know, the vocabulary of addict, but I do say I'm in recovery you know, active recovery kind of softens the blow. But yeah, so I have, you know, originally said the word alcoholic or addict, and there is this tension. But for the most part, someone's like, there's always this opportunity for the other person to speak up, you know, or express, which is amazing. So when I first came in recovery, I was saying it to everyone because I really wanted to remind myself that that's what I was like, like I couldn't forget it. You know? The moment you forget it, the moment you're going downhill again, because uh, you think you're okay. And you know, you're okay. There's always that aspect of, of that self that's 
you know, it's with me. So I don't, you know, I don't uh, label myself as an addict. It was just a, a part of me, but it is a part of me, but that's not who I am today. You know, I'm Rachel. I am lady, you know, I'm sitting here with you ladies and glass blowers. So, you know, that's who I am today, but with all these other parts. But when I do bring up that I am in recovery, I always find a lot of support and always someone that says and opens up for the first time or just brings up a, a part of themselves or their experience. And it's, it's beautiful. So the more I learn to be open, the more I find that other people have a chance to be open to. And uh, that's awesome. So do you have any final thoughts that you want to leave with everybody today? Yes, <laughs> lots of them, but I guess short and sweet, uh, just everyone to be open and honest with themselves, listen uh, to themselves, do things that you want to do, say things that you want to say, you know, talk to people, smile, try not to let the negative get the best of you and keep on trucking whatever that may look like for you so if it's art if it's trying the experience of blowing glass if it's doing jumping jacks on a you know skyscraper you know, do it as long as it doesn't you know harm you or others so yeah just try to pursue the, the happiness that within self and uh, you'll be good <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate this opportunity. You know, it just, it fuels that when I'm down and out, which I have been, you know, so. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Connected in Glass. Make sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram for more information on the artists we interview and for updates on the podcast.